On May 17th, Elon Musk sent out a tweet that simply said, Take the red pill. He was immediately tagged as trying to offer his support for the alt-right. Of course, the media went nuts with it. Here's the question, though. What is the red pill? There's a new uh, a new movement in America where red pilling has been a uh, catch-all term for all kinds of different ideas and uh, and um, and uh, philosophies, I guess you would say. But what exactly is it? As part of the generation that didn't invent conspiracy theories, but definitely took conspiracy theories to the internet and had a ball with it. I can honestly say that when I heard that, I immediately went back to the Matrix, which is the point, right? So the question then became, what are they trying to what are they trying to advocate for? And when we look at the different uh, red pill uh, associations, how it started, what it's turned into, we find that a, a lot of it has to do not just with internet culture, but with the culture of different subgroups within our within our society that have slowly uh, gained importance since 2016 as they've kind of come out of the woodworks. And it's not just the alt-right. So that's the episode today. That's what we're going to talk about. Red pilling on the beta files. Hang on to your diapers, babies. I'm the barber. This is the Beta Files. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. All right. In um, in a article from The Vulture in February of 2019 last year, Max Reed goes on to say, what that truth is varies, talking about the different movements that are happening right now depending on your red pill pharmacist of choice. Sometimes the Matrix is a prefabricated world controlled by a selected few seemingly all-powerful forces like the Banksers, Banks, uh, the Rothschilds, and George Soros. That's from James Red Pills America, um, a popular conspiracy-focused YouTube account that promises to educate the masses as to the reality of the world in which we live today. Sometimes the Matrix is just political liberalism generally, as was the case with Red Pill Black, a YouTube channel created by the right-wing activist Candace Owens with the intent of leading black Americans away from the Democratic Party. The neo to Owens Morpheus was briefly Kanye West, who tweeted in praise of her in 2018 amid his flirtation with Trumpism. He also happens to be a huge Matrix fan. Red pilling is generally right wing versus left wing. Um, the left wing equivalent is being woke, but not always. Sometimes, as in the case of a YouTube channel called Red Pill Vegan, the Matrix is just short sighted Cato diet advice. So, um, and again, that was from The Vultures How the Matrix's Red Pill Became the Internet's Delusional Drug of Choice by Max Reed. So you can go check it out. So what is the red pill? What does it mean? As Reed kind of points out, it can mean a lot of different things. But um, we got it from the Matrix, uh, as you heard from the clip that I played at the beginning of the segment. 
And what the uh, what the Matrix did was open up this whole can of worms for originally uh, my generation, uh, Gen Xers, and then of course later we see the Millennials and Gen Z kind of latch on to it. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we end up with is just this odd, um, this really odd way of engaging with the world through this metaphor that um, that the Matrix movies put forth to us. What's interesting to me is that um, a lot of these movements that promote red peeling um, don't really go into the end of the Matrix, what we get at the end when... Um, when uh, the Oracle and uh, I cannot remember the cop or the 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 guy in shades name to save my life right now, but um, when they at the very very end when they sit down and they basically reveal to the audience that you know the simulation was simulated um, that there is no way to get out of this that the matrix is larger than the matrix that that you see so it, it's like you know coming kind of opening up a box to find another box and then you just keep going down. It's like those little Russian dolls. They ignore that, um, but they latch on to the idea of, okay, you hit this this certain enlightenment. Um, if you actually go on the internet and just type in what is the red pill, um, the first thing that comes up is a Wikipedia definition. <laughs> and it says the red, uh, red pill and blue pill represent a choice between taking um, the red pill that reveals an unpleasant truth or taking a blue pill to remain in blissful ignorance. Um, and so the idea of the red pill is enlightenment, right? You, you're, you open everything up and you get to see um, the man behind the curtain, so to speak, like in The Wizard of Oz. This is not an old idea, right? Um, there's actually um, a guardian... Uh, article that uh, we found. Where is it? It would be it would be smart if I could actually see this stuff a lot easier. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Well, we'll come back to that. Um, but there's a Guardian article that um, talks about a uh, like a 17th century philosopher who came up with this idea that maybe this is all being simulated, that um, that none of it's real, right? So um, how did this at this point in time in 2020? How did the red pill get so much, or this red pill idea? get so much um, traction. Well, it started, oddly enough, um, the group that started it was not the Reddit thread either. It, the Reddit thread was actually the second um, uh, group to pick up on this, which would, and I'll explain in just a second. But the first was just basic men's rights activists. Um, and this is not the um, uh, militaristic, aggressive version that would show up later on uh, Reddit and 4chan, but a more subdued version where um, they weren't, it's not that they were going after feminism, what they were doing were, what they were trying to do at first was poke holes in feminism. Now I'm not defending them, I'm just giving you um, what happened, the reality of what actually happened. Um, and it's later that uh, the the subreddit came along and kind of hijacked it, and um, it became very toxic. But that's the the first iteration is just the original men's rights activism where they were trying to poke holes in some of the feminist claims. Um, it's a tip, it's a natural thing that if you have one side, the other side is going to uh, there's going to be another side that's going to pop up and push back. And in the case of feminism, it's the men's rights activists. And then somewhere in the 2010s, late 2000s, or early 2010s, the subreddit, um, the subreddit line came in, or maybe it was the mid-2010s. Um, it wasn't long after Reddit got started. 
Um, but the subreddit comes along with uh, the subreddit being called the red pill. Now, the men's rights activism, it was, for the longest time, they called themselves red pills, and they were talking about how you could take the red pill and open up your eyes and see that in this patriarchal society, as they put it in quotes, um, wasn't actually designed for the benefit, uh, for the full benefit of men, that there were actually women that um, that got the best benefits because of the disproportion between men going to war versus men, women going to war and how men were uh, disposable in our culture. Now, again, this isn't my argument. This is what they argued, okay? Um, but then you get the subreddit, the red pill, um, which takes this idea and runs with it. And anytime you get anybody who is just aggressive, just naturally aggressive and naturally uh, desires to um, cause all kinds of chaos and anarchy, they're going to take it and run with it. They're going to have a ball with it. So what you end up with um, in this subreddit is a very toxic, um, very anti anything female um, version of men's rights activism. So there's the early days of the red pill, all right? And the idea was to open up your mind and see that feminism had actually led to the suppression of male rights in society. Some of the arguments that the original men's uh, rights activists had make sense. Um, some of them had led have led to... Um, better uh, better laws for men as far as child support, as far as um, uh, uh, child custody. We've started to, we've started to see a shift in that. Um, and then there's also uh, domestic violence um, uh, uh, help for men that we didn't have before, or it was very sparse. Um, you know, we had invent. One of their arguments was we had invested so much money in in uh, trying to help women who were victims of uh, domestic violence that we kind of ignored men who were victims of domestic violence. And not to say that you know that they're equal because there is plenty of evidence out there to show that women are by far the largest uh, category of victims when it comes to domestic violence. But for that small number of men that are victims of domestic violence until men's activism came along to try and push for help for those men, they didn't have anywhere to go, unlike women who had plenty of places to go if they were, uh, and we're talking about like counseling centers and um, uh, refuge homes, um, men didn't have those opportunities. So the men's rights activists kind of push for that, and we're starting to see different places, especially in the larger cities in America, where they have places where men who are victims of domestic violence can go and uh, recover as well. Again, not saying that there's no domestic violence for women. There is, a, like I said, tons of research to show that women are by far the largest, uh, largest category of victims when it comes to domestic violence. Um, so they did. So there has been some positive out of the men's uh, rights activists, but by the time the subreddit got a hold of this, the group that started the subreddit and took off with it, um, it kind of took it in a different direction. And like I said, it became very mil militaristic and very aggressive. Um, and one of the biggest things that the Red Pill subreddit gave us is this i is this ideology. Um, that uh, that went against rape, um, the validity of rape, and it kind of added to the conversation that Me Too would it would eventually turn on its head, right? This idea that um, that women are weak, and a lot of times they provoke rape. That showed up in the uh, in the Red Pill subreddit, um, and of course, Me Too came back. Um, so there's when we see the Harvey Weinstein uh, moment happen, there the build up to that, a lot of that build up is in 
is in response to what's happening with the Red Pill subreddit and that toxicity that's starting to spread. And of course, it gets on Twitter, it gets on Facebook, um, and of course, it's already on on Reddit. When Reddit starts to really clamp down on them, they move to 4chan. Um, and at, to this day, I don't know if they still have. I'm sure they've got something going on somewhere on the internet. Um, but I know it took a while for the larger uh, internet companies that are that were hosting them to clamp down on them and kind of push them out. And there used to be YouTube channels devoted to this, and I'm sure I'm sure in the dark corners of YouTube there still are. Um, so there's there's the second iteration of the red pill movement. The third iteration comes in in response, or not necessarily in response, but in uh, conjunction with the subreddit you start to see white nationalists who take up this anti-feminist um, view because it's uber-liberal, and they start to push back in their white nationalist ways. And a lot of the original Red Pill uh, subreddit users were already white nationalists. So it just kind of blended right into the white nationalist ideal. And to the white nationalists, what the goal was, was to, if you take the red pill as a white nationalist, what you're doing is you're opening up your eyes to see how globalism is tearing our culture apart, tearing our historical uh, historical uh, standing in the world apart, and that nationalism, single single nation ideals mean the most and are going to be the way we get out of this problem with globalism. That's their philosophy, and that's what happens with their red pill. And throughout the campaign for the 2016 uh, presidential election from, you know, around 2015 to about 2017, those, you know, those years around the 2016 presidential election, we see... All these new um, philosophies, new to the nation's narrative, let me put it that way, um, the nation's conversation, that had been suppressed for, for decades, they start coming and they start taking on new forms. And they're being spread by these new, younger uh, uh, proponents. So then you end up with things like QAnon, and Ben Shapiro. Um, and there's also uh, guys like Greg Johnson, uh, Richard Spencer. Um, all of these guys come to prominence, you know, um, because of this quote unquote red pill movement within the alt right. And of course, the, the, the rise in popularity of Breitbart uh, as well. Right? And there are dozens of others. <coughs> Excuse me. So, of course, there's your red pill for the right, and shortly afterwards you have the liberal side of the red pill, which is, um, which kind of goes two ways. You have the red pill version of the liberal argument um, in Antifa, and then you have the red pill, um, the red pill movement in liberalism with the moderate lefts pushing back against the uh, extreme left. So two different um, red pill versions within the liberal um, ideology built there. So when you look at all this, you look at all the the different ways that the red pill has kind of instituted itself politically, um, we go back to the matrix and that, that daring moment where uh, Neo is is presented with the red and, and blue pills and Morpheus warns him, you know, this is it. This is a moment of truth. A lot of the, a lot of what gets missed is, okay, yeah, there are these other ideas and there are these other perceptions to what is happening. What gets missed though is, like I said, the conclusion of the entire Matrix trilogy, which is, that even the simulation could be simulated. 
that that we may be looking at a world that's already preconceived anyway. Maybe they want you to find the red pill. Maybe that's part of the game, right? And so what that does then is kind of throw everything up in the air. So let me tell you a little bit about my um, my experiences with with conspiracy theories. Because I mentioned um, it with the Optic Poet when we were talking about um, what we're binge watching during COVID. I mentioned that I I find UFO conspiracy theory documentaries absolutely fascinating, and I do. They're absolutely wonderful, um, as long as you don't take them serious. Um, I showed one to my oldest son the other day, and it's it's um, called Unacknowledged. And the first half of the documentary, everything he puts out seems plausible, very plausible. And you're you're listening, and you're like, oh my god, this this could actually be happening. And then you get to the second half, and that's where it just kind of takes a left turn, and or right turn, or whatever turn you want to go. And it just it just goes, you know. After that, you're just like, whoa. And it starts about the time that they start talking about how Bill Clinton. Um, tried to push to get uh, information on UFOs, and then uh, he was warned that if he kept pushing any further, that he would end up like Jack Kennedy. And of course, they go down that rabbit hole, and then they tie Marilyn Monroe into it. And all of a sudden, you're sitting there with your mouth on the floor, like, <laughs> "Oh my God, they're they're actually making the claim that Jack Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe were killed because of aliens." Because they knew about the aliens. So, um, which, you know, whatever. If that's your thing, go for it. So, like I said, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. And you have to go into it understanding that it's going to get crazy. At some point, it's going to get crazy. So, um, so that's what uh, that's the way I approach these documentaries. And they're so much fun. They really are a lot of fun. Just to, to the dedication... Um, that it takes to put these things together is just fascinating. Um, and it's really cool. Um, but like I said, you kind of have to go into it knowing that the, you're walking into a lot of BS. Um, but back in the um, early 2000s, around Y2K, um, I was in my early 20s and I got sucked into the rabbit hole. And... A lot of people from my generation did. We we all got sucked in because of a couple of things. Number one, the, the Matrix had been out for a while that, by that point. So we had the Matrix. The internet was giving us the perfect platform to go out and and create these narratives that could or could could possibly have have been happening, and then maybe not. And so during that period, I I joined this website called Above Top Secret. And I don't even know if it's still out there anymore. It's been years. So it's been probably 20 years since I've been on it. 15 years. Um, about 15 years that I've been on um, Above Top Secret. I'm probably still on there if you looked me up. But, but Above Top Secret was just this place that held a bunch of forums, a lot of chat rooms where you could go in and you could discuss all kinds of conspiracies from everything from JFK to the lizard people to just all kinds of good stuff right and for the longest time I got hooked into that stuff I went in and I'm sure not everybody but the, a large part of our population kind of plays with this stuff at some point in their life you know, you get sucked in for a split second, then you pull yourself back out because the thing about going down the rabbit hole is you eventually get into the rabbit hole and after a while you start to realize, how could this even make sense? It just got, at some point you realize that the logic just doesn't work. Um, now there are some people that it doesn't. Some people go down in the rabbit hole and they stay there. Unfortunately, I was smart enough to realize that, wait a minute, something's just not right with all this. And I came back out of the rabbit hole. But I did learn some stuff when I was down in there. And in, we're not talking about context. We're talking about structure. How conspiracy theories are built. How conspiracy theories spread. 
how you can actually change a point of view and see a completely different narrative. And I learned that very uh, easily. And the good thing was, was I was just out of uh, college as an undergrad when I started to come to this realization that, you know, which helped because uh, as an undergrad, I went for playwriting. And so, of course, we're looking at structures and, you know, story structure and plot structures and that kind of thing. And Shakespeare seven plots and that stuff. And so we, what I learned from, um, from conspiracy theories was how to build a really good narrative and how to spin it. Which, of course, you know, being a student of rhetoric too, I really got to see um, some really cool ways of dealing with narratives and dealing with stories. Um, and I came out of all that with a better understanding of multiple points of view. Understanding how, okay, this person saw this and this person saw that. It was shortly after that that I read Mein Kampf for the first time. Now, I'm sure, oh my God, um, I don't hate the Jews, okay? You can read Mein Kampf and come out of it without having, wanting to have a Holocaust. Um, in fact, anybody with a rational head can tell within the first chapter, this man has lost his nuts. He has lost his in mind um, and it's important but it's important to read that book it's important to understand why he thought what he thought and how he was planning to execute the actions that he was going to execute it's extremely important it's extremely important to read the communist manifesto and I tell my students this all the time you got to read this book read it and see what Marx is saying before you go and hear all the people on the right and all the people on the left give their interpretations of Marx, that's not the real Marx. And socialism, according to Marx, is way different than what we define as socialism. So go and read it. He, he nails the working class and the rich class, the proletariat and the bourgeois, perfectly. And you can see it throughout the centuries on how um, how these two classes have uh, interacted with each other. It's not conspiratorial in any way. He just says, this is what it is. And you look in reality, and there it is. So, um, so I did go down the rabbit hole for a while um, in my early 20s, early to mid-20s. And I came back out. Um, I, I usually tell people when we get talking about um, uh, conspiracies, we talk about um, you know Illuminati and Bilderbergers and um, you know, all that good stuff. And I tell I tell my students constantly the only conspiracy is that there's a conspiracy because I think that's the the big truth of the Matrix. At the end, that maybe they want you to think there is and there's there's nothing there right and I think we miss that a lot one of the things about um, you know I watched a, um, a thing on YouTube a few weeks ago and I was talk, telling Jay about this in one of our um, in one of our optic poets segments segments um, but I was telling him you know it makes this guy who did the Area 51 thing said, you know, the the only conspiracy behind Area 51 is that they hyped it. You know, the the U.S. government took and ran with it and said, "Ooh, we got something here, and we can actually hype it and take, you know, eyes off the ball." So there's no real deep conspiracy of aliens being hidden and all that stuff. It's just that they really were doing stuff with secret aircraft, and they didn't want anybody to know about it. So they kind of put a smoke screen out. Um, to keep your eye off the ball. And it worked. It worked perfectly. So, um, but it's not a, a grand conspiracy to take over the world, right? It's a conspiracy to keep you from, you know, digging into these secret aircraft that a lot of them we now know about. is We're talking about the stealth bomber. We're talking about the stealth fighter. We're talking about the SR-71, the U-2 spy plane, all those. Um, so when we look at that kind of stuff, it's, that's, that's the idea, right? 
So when we talk about the red pill and we look at these different movements, what they've done is they've taken that idea, the original idea of the conspiracy theory, which is to kind of open your mind up, and the idea of the matrix and hijacked it, right? Um, to show, uh, to kind of play with the notion and play with the idea that we're being lied to. To a certain extent, we are being lied to, but not in a grand conspiracy kind of way. You know, they're not they're not out to to enslave you. That would actually do nothing for them. If you stopped and thought about just using common sense to understand the the basic structure of these conspiracy theories, like the Illuminati. Okay, what's the end goal of the Illuminati? To enslave the human race. Why? Why? And there's no real answer to that. And then conspiracy theorists would, you know, probably put forward the idea, you know, well, so the, the elite can have all the control. So why would they enslave everybody if they want to keep all the control? All they have to do is keep all the money, which is what they basically done, right? <coughs> to keep us from uprising. You know, that's the other one. So what, 7 billion people? Um, the other thing is logistics. Now, I usually tell my students about this. Um, there are... About 220, 230,000 people in Guilford County, I think, was the last last uh, number I saw. Of course, the census will come out and they'll readjust the number. But last time I looked, it was like 220, 230,000 people in Guilford County. Um, and you have, you know, and I'm guesstimating here, about 100, 150 officials at the top that try to control 220, 230,000 people, and they can't. If they could, we wouldn't have a police department. We wouldn't have a fire department. But they can't. They can't control all of us in this count, in this one county. So how is a group of, and I'm trying to remember the, the Bilderberger number, I think it's 400 and some. How can 400 and some odd people control 7 billion? They can't. Logistically, it's impossible. What about Alexa? What about Google Home? What about it? Do you honestly think that they have a person listening to you all the time? No. Do the math. In order for them to listen to us, if they're just going to do America, just the United States, so we have like 323 million people, I think. We'll just do an even number, 300 million. Okay, you'd have to have 300 million people to listen to 300 million people, and you'd have to have 300 million more to listen to the 300 million people that are listening to the 300 million people. It doesn't make any sense. What they have are computers, and they are listening. Absolutely, they're listening. Facebook is the worst for it. One of the things that was weird when I was on Facebook is you could be talking about some kind of product, and I'm sure I'm going to get ads in the morning from my phone for, you know, talking about products. Um, but it, you could talk about a product and Facebook within like 15, anywhere between 15 minutes to an hour will have ads pop up on your news feed about what you were just talking about. So yeah, they're listening. They're listening so they can market. That's it. They don't care about your sister Susie and breaking up with her boyfriend. They're not listening for that. They're listening to see what you're buying. Or what you would like to buy. So if you talk about Tide Pods all the time. I promise you. At some point. Your phone is going to start showing you. Advertisements of Tide Pods. Or gain. To get you to buy gain. Depending on who paid who the most. It happens with me every morning. With the Washington Post. Whatever I was looking at on Amazon. The previous day. There's my ads for the Washington Post. Every day. So it's, you know, it is an invasion of privacy. It is kind of disheartening. But at the same time, 
What are they taking from you? Nothing. They're just trying to get your money. And you're going to spend money. Right? So going back to the Illuminati thing, if they're going to take over the world, why? Just why? What's the point? What what would be the point in enslaving the human race? Seven billion people. What would be the point? There's no real answer to that because any answer you come up with just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't. Are there human beings out there that are just plain bad and evil? Yeah. But what happens? There's a there's a wonderful Twilight Zone episode where you've got this gangster guy and he dies. He gets shot by the police and he goes to what he thinks is heaven. And he gets to gamble and have sex with as many women as he wants. He gets the best food ever. He gets the top-notch clothes. He gets everything he ever wanted on earth. Day after day after day. And after a while, it starts to get old and he gets bored. Because he's gotten everything he wants. And then, of course, you find out the trick at the end is he's not in heaven. He's in hell, and that was his hell. His hell was he got everything he wanted. But without being able to earn it, without being able to um, desire it. You take the desire away, all of a sudden, everything means nothing. So it's really cool. And so when you ask yourself about this with these um, these horrible Illuminati elites that are... You know, so power hungry that they're going to enslave the human race. Well, once they enslave the human race, what are they going to do? Doesn't make sense. I think they're if they're smart enough to know this, they're smart enough to know that enslaving the entire population is not the answer. There are other ways to get what they want. So maybe they are out there and they're already getting what they want from you, and you don't even realize it. Maybe that's the matrix. Maybe that's the simulation. Who knows? So anyway, so coming back to the red pill, <laughs> sorry. Um, when we look at the red pill and we look at the question of what is truth, what is truth according to what we understand as truth based on our political affiliations, what is our truth based on our geography, what is truth based on our economic standing. So you have a lot of different truths in your life that you're kind of defined by. So when you red pill, which truth are you taking down? Can you take down any of those truths? So let's say that I decide I'm going to red pill and go conservative, go all right. Okay, how's that going to affect the other truths in my life? Some of them is going to affect quite a bit. Some of them is not. It's not going to affect it at all. It will not affect my economic situation. Um, it will not affect my religious truth, my spiritual truth. Because what I will do is is basically have the same religious ideals as I had before. But there will be certain things that I start to mold towards this new political ideal. But the same truth is still there. Same faith. So what is the point then of red pilling? Well, my argument is it's a... It's an endless game of pushback. And I think it is for people who are naturally antagonistic and don't want to engage with any other side besides their own. And unfortunately, I think American culture kind of fosters this to a certain extent. Because when you look at um, you look at the inherent greed of our capitalist 
culture, it leads to mine. The the idea of mine. I always think of the the Nemo, uh, the Nemo movie. You know, mine, mine, uh, the seagulls, right? But this idea, I have to have mine. You know, this a uh, culture of abundance is uh, what Warren Sussman called it. And red pilling just basically reinforces that. It reinforces the idea that you are, and you're going to grab as much as you can and push back, sometimes very uh, uh, aggressively against the opposition. So what is red pilling? It's just basically looking at a situation from a different angle. You're not really repilling the truth because your your fundamental truths are not going to change. Who you are, where you grew up, where you're from, they're not going to change. Whereas uh, your political ideas may change. And there are moments where we all have red pill moments where something we truly believed for a very long time gets stripped away, right? Um, so, for example, let's say you have uh, Bill Cosby. The The whole Bill Cosby mo- moment was a red pill moment for all of us. Matt Lauer, huge red pill moment for all of us. Because here you have these two men who were, and I'm picking those two. There were several others. The Kevin Spacey one was a huge red pill moment for all of us. But these these figures in our public life that we had kind of like looked up to and esteemed to and then all of a sudden the real the real version comes out and we all kind of get red pilled that way so sometimes the red pilling actually happens and it's a positive thing and we get to see the truth behind um, the real truth behind something that we've been lied to about but the red pilling that is happening on the internet that the internet just fosters over and over and over and over like the men's rights um, movement and the the subreddit movement and then the alt-right and then all the liberal things that are happening you know Antifa that kind of thing all those red pill things those are toxic those are dangerous and so I think we gotta we gotta um, back off of them a little bit and that's the, the red pill stuff all right, um, so there you go. So there's our podcast for today. Um, next time on Friday, you know, the next episode that we do, um, we're going to be talking about masculinity and what masculinity means for Gen X and what masculinity in turn then means for the millennials and Gen Z and that kind of thing. What does it mean to be a man now? Is it good to be manly? Or is it all bad? Right? So that's going to be um, that's going to be what we look at next time. Check us out on YouTube. Hit subscribe uh, when you get over there. And then uh, ring the bell for notifications. Check us out on Instagram. We are at the beta file. Not files, but file. At the beta file. Um, Instagram wouldn't let me add the S. So check us out there every um, every Wednesday and Thursday we post new things to IGTV, which is their long form uh, videos. Uh, we have text messages from the living room on Wednesdays, and then now see this here now then on Thursdays. Of course, all the content that we have is hosted on our blog, which is thebetafiles.com, and make sure you get the in there. Because if you don't, betafiles.com is just a blank page. Um, But thebetafiles.com, that's where we're at. So check us out. And uh, check out the podcast again um, in a couple days. Make it a great day. Um, And I will see you right back here.